We are at chapter 6, and we stopped the last time at verse 13. So I will continue from verse 14. With a pacified self, with all fear banished, remaining in the vow of a celibate, controlling the mind, with the mind absorbed in me, one should dwell joined in yoga and intent upon me. Thus uniting himself in yoga, the yogi with a well-directed mind reaches that peace, the ultimate of which is absorption, nirvana, and the foundation of which is in me. This chapter, uh, this verse, speaks of celibacy. As you know, this entire chapter is on Dhyana Yoga and there are some very practical instructions in this chapter. One might be tempted to think a very simple explanation of verse 13 would be the Bhagavad Gita recommends celibacy. Brahmacharya means walking in Brahma. Acharya means Brahm, walking and Brahma is Brahman. Walking in Brahman. Brahmacharya has far, far deeper meaning than practicing celibacy or sexual restraint. Brahmacharya or walking in Brahman is when one goes beyond male and female. The verse before says with your head, neck and trunk aligned Sit unmoving and focus your attention at Nasikagram, that is the space between the nostrils. This point here, Nasikagram, is the space between the left and right, right nostrils. These two, left and right, are the Naris, Ida and Pingala, and they symbolize the two dualities, male and female. When, with your attention focused at that space between the two nostrils, the Attention flows, the energy flows in the central ca canal, which is known also as Centralis Canalis or Sushumna. We also speak of this as Sandhya, the wedding of sun and moon. At this point, dualities vanish. Male and female loses its meaning as the practitioner enters the non-dualistic state or at least gains some glimpses of that non-dualistic state. This is beyond all dualities, beyond hot and cold, pleasure and pain, male, female, beyond these dualities. A celibate, a person who is beyond the genders, beyond male and female, walks in Brahman. Such a being sees all 
as consciousness. Such a being does not see you as a male or as a female. Thus, Brahmacharya has a far, far deeper meaning than merely celibacy. It is attaining a glimpse of non-dual reality and being absorbed in that. Such a yogi then finds it very simple and natural to unite with the higher self. When the mind is not externally busy or moving, it enjoys contemplation. Contemplation is its natural state. So a mind that's not distracted, not outward going, withdraws within, retreats within, and rests in itself and the self is revealed. In these few verses, the Bhagavad Gita explains the entire process in very simple words of how to sit, where to focus on, and how one will attain the highest. You can say that the verses 10 to 15 of chapter 6 are a summary of the entire process. Of meditation. Any questions so far? Good, in that case we can continue. Oh, I missed something. Okay, yes, here we are. Verses 16 and 17. There is no yoga for one who eats much or who eats nothing at all or for one who is inclined to excessive sleep, or one who awakes altogether, O Arjuna. He whose food and enjoyment are balanced, whose movements and actions are balanced, whose sleeping and waking are balanced, his yoga becomes the eliminator of sorrows. These verses make very clear that the Bhagavad Gita does not recommend extremes. There are many parts in yoga, there have been many instances of extreme practices which border on self-torture in the name of austerities. However, the Bhagavad Gita is very clear on this matter. It says that one who eats excessively or one who eats nothing at all, who fasts, cannot attain those who sleep too long 
or those who force themselves to keep awake, who keep awake all the time, are also not really practicing yoga, cannot attain that state of yoga, which is union of individual self with the universal self. These excessive practices, too much food, too little food, too much sleep, no sleep, they disturb the mind. They disturb the energies of the body. These aspects, food, sleep, must be well regulated. Food and sleep are important for the body as well as the mind. Torturing mind and body is a form of violence and it also disturbs the body and mind and is not useful for meditation or attainment of higher states of yoga. And the, on the other hand, the one whose food is balanced, whose movements, actions are balanced, whose sleeping, waking is balanced, his yoga eliminates all sorrows. We have often spoken about this a balanced lifestyle is very important and is one of the stepping stones. Long before we start meditation practices, or reading esoteric books, it is of utmost most importance to establish a healthy lifestyle. A healthy and balanced lifestyle is an absolute necessity. Without a healthy and balanced lifestyle, we cannot really progress. Excessive food or sleep, too little food or too little sleep will continuously disturb a meditator, disturb the mind, create a lot of movement, in the mind, such a mind cannot really meditate. Can you imagine yourself trying to pay attention to the space between the nostrils when you're starving yourself? If you have fasted and you insist on fasting very long periods, and you're continuously hungry, where will your mind go? Will it go to the space between the nostrils? Or will it always be preoccupied with the thoughts of food? Will it always be disturbed by hunger? The answer, I think, is quite obvious. When you're hungry, the mind will continuously think about food. A mind or a person that is very greedy, is into excessive eating, it's so always thinking about food. Also, on the other hand, cannot meditate because the senses, manas, has not been trained and the mind is continuously dwelling on food. In this way, we understand that too much or too little is not healthy. The same is with sleep. If you have not slept enough, you're tired, the mind and body need rest and you force yourself to meditate, what is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Anybody? If you haven't slept enough? Shreeram? <laughs> You've been working a lot. You can tell us. 
Have you tried to meditate with very little sleep? What happens? Well, Matthias, I don't know about going mad. That depends on how little sleep you've had. If you do not sleep at all for a day or so, you can start hallucinating. But if you just sleep very little, um, what would happen when you try to meditate? So, Shibu says, you'll fall asleep. Yes. When you are sitting in meditation and trying to focus your mind at the space between the nostrils, instead of meditating, you will fall asleep. That's what happens. What happens if you sleep a lot? You're sleeping a lot, you know, you, you, you sleep too much. There are some people, they, they, they sleep, you know, 10-12 hours a day. So what happens when you sleep a lot? Try to meditate. What is going to happen? person who sleeps a lot is very tamasic, very heavy. Such a person cannot really meditate, cannot concentrate. And yes, as Shibu says, it's very likely you will fall asleep again. Because the person is so dull, cannot really focus the mind at all. So you see how important it is to regulate these primitive urges of sleep and food. It is not easy to balance. So sometimes I have been asked Yes, how do we balance uh, sleep? How do we manage? It's so difficult to manage with sleep. And I agree, sleep is difficult to manage, especially since we cannot interfere too much with natural sleep patterns. So we should regulate our sleep with healthy habits like Going to sleep at the same time every day. I know in our busy lives this seems to be difficult for a lot of people. But try to do this. Try to form this habit. Try to sleep at the same time every day. And try to wake up at the same time every day. If you get 7 to 8 hours of sleep every day, it's quite enough. Yes, seven to nine hours or so. Depends on most people. This does not apply for infants, children, those who are sick, those who are old and pregnant women. This is for normal, healthy adults. Seven to eight hours is generally enough. We are so troubled by our very active social media lives and our mobiles keep making noises in the night. We can use these mobiles or modern technology to help us rather than create problems for us. If you set some alerts for bedtime and go to bedtime at at a certain time and you wake up at a regular time. So that's one way to regulate sleep. Another thing is most people very often use the time before sleep for watching things on television and sometimes these things are not necessarily very positive also, the continuous movement on the, on the screen, on the television screen, all, all these 
images disturb the mind. So it's important that an hour or so before we sleep, you do not watch television or surf on internet. Rather, you use that time to calm down, have a little ritual, you know, bedtime ritual. Um, to calm down, you know, you brush your teeth, you change your clothes, etc., etc. And you can read a page or two of some spiritual book. This puts in good positive thoughts and you will have a different quality of sleep. Also, do not eat very heavy foods in the evening, late evening, and do not take um, black tea or green tea um, after 2 or 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, some good things that you can do to help with the quality of sleep is, as Shibu suggests here or asks here, can, can I do diaphragmatic breathing? And in fact, diaphragmatic breathing is a very good practice before bedtime. If uh, you can include that in your ritual, that's also a very nice thing to do. And those who are meditating regularly before bedtime, in any case, that is the best thing you can do. As for food, I think food is a very, very long and large topic. So briefly, I would say, as far as possible, eat sattvic food. Avoid non-vegetarian food or heavy foods, especially in the evening. Have regular meals at regular timings. And as far as possible, eat freshly cooked food. For those who are busy and working and traveling, one needs to, of course, adjust and find flexible solutions, creative solutions to this problem, such as carrying your own food or finding a good place where one can eat fresh, well-cooked food. So that is about moderation in our lifestyle so that we do not create further obstacles. Okay, so any further questions about this? If you gently prepare yourself before bedtime, then you will not have any problems falling asleep. I know that there are some of you who prepare yourself for bedtime, do everything wonderful, do your meditation and then before you go to bed then you again look at your Facebook uh, <laughs> and um, you know, uh, surf or, or something. So that, that, that makes no sense. All the, the preparation for bedtime is then undone if you then again look at uh, your mobile and start uh, looking at uh, your, your notifications and messages. You should already switch off everything, laptops and mobiles and televisions and all possible devices already long before you go to bed, at least half an hour before you go to bed, preferably one hour before you go to bed.
Okay, so we continue to verses 18 to 20. When a very well-controlled mind remains stable in the self, alone, detached from all desires, then one is called joined in yoga. As a lamp in a place without breeze does not tremble, this is the simile of a yogi whose mind is controlled practicing the yoga of the self. Where the mind ceases, withdrawn through the observation of yoga, where one sees the self, the little self, the mind in the self, one is satiated in the self. These chapters describe what would happen if you have a well-controlled mind. What is a well-controlled mind? The word control has certain colouring. We all think of control as in, you know, um, doing things in a certain way. And when it comes to controlling the mind, it means somehow that we force ourselves to do things that we don't really want to do. This is not what is actually meant by a well-controlled mind. A well-controlled mind is a mind where all the four aspects of the mind are well-coordinated. So, we come back to our basics of the mind. We have four aspects of four functions Manas, Buddhi, Chitta and Hankara. When these four aspects of the mind are well coordinated, then we say the mind is well controlled. What does it mean to be well coordinated? If you think in terms of team sports, I often use this example, it's repetitive but Repetition is what teachers do. That if you have a team, a sport, and all the members of that team are playing together to achieve one goal and not playing against each other. Imagine you play football and one person wants to be the star in the team and he wants all the glory. He is not playing with the team spirit. He is there to glorify himself and that can be very damaging for the team. So, when Manas, Vaddi, Chitta, Lankara are all coordinated and agree that we want to work for the greater good, then we have a well-coordinated mind. But if Ahankara says he has some other ideas, doesn't want to do this, doesn't want to have, for example, a moderate lifestyle. He, Ahankara says, I want to keep awake the whole night. That way I can show off to people that I am able to stay up the whole night. So, in this way, the mind can become an obstacle to itself. A mind that is not creating obstacles, a mind which is well coordinated, is stable and will very naturally attain that stability and be joined in yoga, attain that state of union. And such a one has a mind like a lamp which is placed in a space where there's no breeze. The, the, the flame is very steady. And such a person whose mind is well controlled is still, is steady. There's no movement in the mind. And when there's no movement, it's very easy or very simple to attain. It becomes very natural. So I 
I hope that this was clear. The idea of a stable mind is a mind that does not move. Mind that's steady. And such a mind is one where all the four aspects are well coordinated, working as a team together. Any questions so far? Okay, everybody seems to be pretty clear on this. So, verses 21 to 23. The ultimate happiness is that which is grasped by intelligence and is beyond the senses. When one knows this happiness, dwelling in it, he no longer moves from the knowledge of that reality. Attaining which one no longer believes in any other gain to be greater than that, staying in which one is not shaken by even the greatest sorrow. Now that elimination of union with sorrows is to be known as yoga. That yoga should be practiced resolutely by one who has made his mind dispassionate. So this limitless happiness is grasped by buddhi and it is something that is beyond the senses. We all know of a happiness that comes due to reasons. We all know of a happiness that we experience through our senses, sensory pleasures. Happiness because we have a reason, you know, you got something that others don't have or you got something in uh, like a house, a car, a promotion, uh, a partner. These are all things at a sensory level. These are not unlimited. The, this form of happiness is limited. If the car gets old, you're not happy anymore. The house is, you know, is also getting old or is, is, is no longer, you know, you don't want to stay there any longer. Then also you're not happy. Partners, you know, may change their minds as it happens and that partner doesn't give you happiness anymore. You have happiness of, of offspring, you have children, and then you find out your children become grown-up adults and they have their own minds. Then you're not happy. So this kind of happiness is limited. We are speaking of unlimited happiness, that which is beyond the senses. Happiness without a reason, joy without a reason. Think of the happiest moment in your life. Maybe some of you will say, the happiest moment was when I got married. The happiest moment was when I saw my partner the first time and I just knew it was right. Others may say the happiest moment was when we, I got a child, offspring. Depending on the phase in life, some of you may say oh, the happiest moment was when um, I got my first salary. I felt very good about it. 
Now imagine that moment of happiness and imagine that that moment would last forever and has no reason. There's no reason anymore. It's just that feeling of joy which keeps lasting, not temporarily, but forever, eternally. And there is actually no reason for it. That is an experience of Samadhi. And when you can stay established in it for a longer time, you become a witness, Sakshatkar. Then you know that there is nothing else that is greater than this or better than this. This is there is nothing more worth aspiring for. And staying in that reasonless joy, you are so established in it that even something would happen that would be a cause for sorrow, but you would not be affected by it. Because you are established now firmly in that eternal joy. So the greatest of sorrows would not trick you then. Because you know that all these, what gives you sorrow can give you joy, but also gives you sorrow, is all temporary and transient. It's not merely a theory that you now know, but it is a direct experience. Just as the experience of the birth of your first child or getting your first salary gave you immense joy. That same joy, but reasonless joy, you have experienced now by attaining this high state of Samadhi. And it is very clear that nothing else can match this. This will eliminate all your sorrows. Before you were in a sense united with sorrows, your entire life was going up and down. Sometimes you were happy, sometimes you were sad, sometimes you were joyous, sometimes you were miserable. Sometimes you felt good, sometimes you felt bad. There are always moments when you were successful, then you were not successful. And so, you went up and down. And you can say that this roller coaster, these ups and downs of emotions, that is basically sorrow. And when you are established in eternal joy, that is yoga. And this happens when the mind no longer moves, it's steady, due to a perfect coordination between the four aspects of the mind. And when the mind is well coordinated, it doesn't move, it doesn't go outwards, it becomes very contemplative, and when that happens, you attain your natural state, and your natural state is that of the self, the pure self. So that was verses 21 to 23. It is 
about reasonless joy or eternal happiness. Okay, any <clears throat> questions? So far, is everybody established in eternal joy and happiness? That would be nice. Everybody seems to be quite content. I uh, will just continue in that case. Verses 24 to 28. Giving up all desires born of volition in their entirety, controlling the entire group of senses with the mind alone, and from all sides, slowly, slowly, one should turn away with the help of intelligence, which is held in steady fastness, making the mind stable in the self. Then one should think entirely of nothing. In whatever direction the fickle and unstable mind wanders out, from that very direction, one should pull it and bring it under the control of the self alone. The best happiness comes only to such a yogi whose mind is pacified, whose dust has settled, who has become identified with Brahman, who is free from all stains. Thus, uniting the self in yoga, the yogi free from all stains, easily enjoys the ultimate happiness, which is contact with Brahman. There are some aspects of this translation that I'm not very happy with. But these verses reiterate what was said earlier. It's the process of using the willpower and starting to control the senses, beginning with the senses and slowly turning away from the external world with the help of intelligence. Your intelligence is actually buddhi. Following buddhi, irrespective of whatever happens, just keep following buddhi and slowly making the mind stable. The mind may wander out, but bring it back in. Following Buddhi. Buddhi will guide. If Buddhi guides and you follow, it may be difficult initially, but as you keep doing it, slowly, it becomes more natural. It becomes easier. And eventually, the mind gets steadier. And with such a steady mind, eventually gets identified not with the samskaras of the leading out into the world, but gets identified with Brahman itself, the universal self. And then enjoys that eternal happiness. These verses are encouraging us to keep following Buddhi and to slowly turn away from the sensory world around us and make our minds steady and stable.
Buddhi is our guide, the internal teacher, the internal guide. When you are practicing meditation, there is nobody else who can help you. When you are sitting in meditation, you can't keep talking to your teacher, assuming your teacher is there. You still cannot keep asking your teacher for help. Because if you do, then you cannot go inwards. The teacher is outside. If you want to attain something that is beyond the senses, then you have to go within. This eternal joy that we speak of, reasonless joy, is beyond the senses. The senses cannot help you and nothing external can help you either. The only one who can help you then is Buddhi, your own internal guide will give you light in this difficult path. The difficult part is making the mind steady. The difficult part is coordinating the four aspects of the mind. Once these aspects have been well coordinated and there's a little bit of purification has taken place, then it becomes much, much easier or simpler. It's the first steps that are hard because the mind is totally untrained. But we all have to go through that ourselves. You may have the best teacher in the world, but the best teacher in the world cannot do it for you. You have to do it yourself. I have many students who then sometimes come and say, oh, you know, I, I had a dream about Swami Rama, I had a dream about Mahavatar, Babaji and, and Shiva and all sorts of things. And these are nice, these are very encouraging, these are very inspiring. But ultimately, we have to do these ourselves. Our part has to be done. Any questions so far? Verses 29 to 32. One whose self is joined in yoga, looking evenly at everything, sees the self dwelling in all beings and all beings in the self. He who sees me everywhere and sees everything in me, for him I do not vanish, nor does he vanish from me. He who established in unity devotes himself to me, who am dwelling in all beings, through though operative in manifold ways, that yogi still remains in me. He who sees everything alike, as similar to himself, O Arjuna, whether in comfort or discomfort, he is considered to be the highest yogi. So what happens when the Individual self is in union with the universal self. That is yoga. That's what yoga means. That's what union means. So the Atma, your Atman is now united with the universal self, Paramatman. You see then Atman in every being. Such a being, one who is established in yoga, sees Atman or sees consciousness in all beings. And he sees all the beings in consciousness. That means consciousness is, is the foundation. It's, it's if you have a blackboard and you write on the blackboard, you're writing with the chalk. The chalk is consciousness. 
But the blackboard is also consciousness. So everything is consciousness. All the beings are consciousness, all the, all the creatures. And all the creatures and beings are in consciousness. And if you see this consciousness everywhere, in everything, you cannot, this, this cannot vanish, cannot disappear. He will see all beings as manifestation, just taking form. These different forms, it's like clay. You know, out of clay, you can make different little figures. You can make different people, you can make animals, you can make everything. It's the stuff from which these figures are made. They're made out of clay. What are we made of? What is the stuff that we are all made of? What is the stuff that the world around us is made of? It's all made of consciousness. And so consciousness is manifesting in different forms. And the yogi who sees this, the yogi who sees what, what I just described to you, what the Bhagavad Gita just described, and he sees that, in all times, whether it's, it's good, you know, in, in comfort or in discomfort, sees this all the time, he is the highest of yogis. We can just let that sink in. It's very beautiful to contemplate upon, to imagine what it would be like to be, be a yogi. It's once again a word of caution. It's not what you're supposed to do. It is describing a state. Telling yourself to see Atman and all beings, to see consciousness everywhere. <clears throat> is not the solution. This aspect of the Bhagavad Gita, these parts of the Bhagavad Gita have been misunderstood and misinterpreted by teachers, by traditions who recommend that you should see Atman in everyone. But trying to see Atman in everyone is very contrived. What it means is that it should happen naturally that you do see Atman in everyone. When that bhava comes naturally to you, that is an attainment. Any thoughts or questions about this? So Arjun has been listening to Krishna, to Krishna's beautiful words and Sri Krishna has taught some of the highest teachings to Arjun here. How does Arjun respond to this? What does Arjun say? Arjun is a symbol here of a good student. Any of you would also have responded exactly like Arjun does in the following verses. Verses 33 to 36, Arjuna says, I do not see the stability of this yoga through equanimity that you have taught, O Krishna. 
to be lasting because of the mind's fickleness. The mind is indeed fickle, turbulent, very powerful and strong. I believe its control to be as difficult as that of the wind. Very natural that Arjun, like most normal students would, says, yes, I understand this, but it seems to be very difficult because the mind is so unsteady. All of us who have become a little self-aware may or may not have done some meditation, but even if you are a little self-aware, you know that the mind is very powerful, very fickle, very difficult to, to guide or to restrain or to direct. Arjun is well aware of that. And he is not quite convinced that the teachings of Sri Krishna can really help him because he says the mind is as powerful as the wind. What does Sri Krishna say to this? The Blessed Lord said, No doubt, O Arjuna, the mind is difficult to control and ever moving, but, O son of Kunti, it can be held through practice and dispassion. Yoga is difficult to be found by someone whose self is not in control. This is my view. But by someone who endeavors with a controlled self, it can be attained by appropriate means. Sri Krishna responds, Yes, it is true, the mind is very difficult, but it can be done. And he says, just like the Yoga Sutras, Abhyas and Vairagya, practice and dispassion. And through this, you can learn to direct and train your mind. It is not easy for someone if the mind is not well trained. But for the mind, but the one whose mind is well trained, with appropriate methods can attain yoga. The focus here would be on appropriate methods. There are many, many different methods. And while there may be sincere students, there may be those who are deeply longing, but if they do not have the right methods, then they will be lost. The Yoga Sutra talks of three kinds of methods. It says that there are those that are mild, there are the medium, and those that are speedy. So if you use methods that are very mild or medium, that will take a long time for you to see a difference. But if the methods are appropriate, really speedy methods, then you will be able to direct and train the mind. Any thoughts or questions about this so far? Everybody seems to be quite um, satisfied. There are no questions. 
so far. No any thoughts on this. In that case, I would like to stop here. We continue then next Friday. And next Friday, we will probably complete chapter 6. And at the end of chapter 6, we will have basically completed about one third of the Bhagavad Gita. And um, the next, um, I think, 10 verses are also very interesting because they deal with the doubts of Arjun and Krishna's response to his doubts. All right. Thank you, everybody. It's nice having you again after a short break. We meet um, next Friday, same time. Bye-bye, everyone.